Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? Good. All right. Very excited to be here tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is Jason Hanley. I'm the VP of Education here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it is always a pleasure when we have a Hall of Fame inductee in the house. And tonight, we've got none other than Lowell Tolhurst. As I'm sure many of you guys know, Lowell is a founding member of The Cure, drummer, keyboard player, has played in other bands, and of course has a great uh, autobiography he wrote called Cured, which he'll be signing after the event today. A fantastic book, and we're really excited to have him here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame today to talk about his life and career. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome none other than Lowell Tolhurst. Lowell, thank you uh, so much for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. We've had uh, a lovely day today. You've um, had a busy day. We've, we've yeah, kept a very you busy, busy day. Yeah, <laughs> very busy day. But it's been it's been great, and uh, it makes a, a whole lot of difference to actually come to the place and see it. You know, you can think about it or hear about it, but actually to come to the place and see all the things was was very emotional for me. You know, very. Yeah, and I know you were able, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you get to film, uh, or rather record your Curious Creatures podcast here today as well, yeah, too, yeah, down yeah, in the studio, yeah, which was great. Yes, yeah, yeah, that was good, and uh, I have the, the raw string out now uh, <laughs> to listen to on the flight home. Um, right. Yeah, no, it was great, it was really good, so it's been a great day. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, rereading your book, Cured, was a really great experience because... I love how you go through the entire history of your creativity and spend a lot of time in the early days. Cause I think that's for many musicians, that's such an important thing about what forms them, what gives them their idea of why they get into rock and roll in the first yeah. place. So I thought maybe tonight we could start a little bit about growing up uh, near Crawley in England and you were sort of interested in music very early on, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, my earliest memory was uh, standing in the kitchen at home and my, my mother was standing there with, with my grandmother and uh, the radio was playing, you know, because that's what we had back then. And uh, she said, oh, he knows all the songs on the radio and sings them to my grandmother. And I was like, that must be what I have to do. I have to sing the songs. You know? So it didn't quite turn out quite like that, but that was the start, yeah. yeah. And when did you first really get into rock and roll? What were some of those early moments where you started realizing like, oh, this this music's pretty cool. This is a little bit interesting yeah i mean you know I, I had two elder brothers who who was sort of interested in music you know they would they would go up to london you know it's like 20 miles away and hang out at the sort of the blues clubs in the 60s which is where you know a lot of the the, the sort of cross-pollination started you know and um so i would listen to what they were listening to you know but then i didn't really have my own uh record player or anything until my sister uh, was leaving home and she gave me her this little sort of dance it thing and her German Beatles album, right? So, because she'd been in Switzerland uh, for a while. So she came back, she gave me that and I played that. And then I started making up a list of all the albums that I have to get and then I had to make a plan to get them. Yeah. And I didn't really have any money, you know? So uh, the, the, the thing that made it all possible was the local library because, uh, you know, I had three library tickets when you're only really supposed to have one <laughs> and for some reason. And not only would they give uh, lend out books, but they would also records, records too, you yeah. know, and that's where I got my education from because for one summer, I, I don't know, I was probably about 11 and I just listened religiously, like, you know, get John Lee Hooker one week, get Bob Dylan the next one and get all the records I could find and just, you know, process it all. and. It was kind of a unique situation. I, I, I suppose this is what happens for a lot of musicians, because most musicians, you probably realize, are quite, they're misfits, most of us, you know? We're not really meant to do anything other than this. And, you know, I know that's true. So, um, for me, you know, listening to all these things sort of confirmed that, you know, that I could I could get something from it and, and listen. And, you know, I didn't have an easy, way of doing it, but I also, I, I didn't live in the town where I went to school, you know, I, I grew up Catholic in England, which is kind of different, 
And uh, so I, I didn't have a school in my hometown. I had to go to the next town. So summer, you know, summer holiday, summer break was very empty. There's nobody around that I knew that I went to school with. So music became my companion, M music and books, you know. Yeah, and I know it's always interesting too. You know, you think about you being in The Cure and you guys really helped to define such a unique sound in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, that you know, so many other artists end up doing that kind of gothic alternative new wave sound, but for you, of course, that doesn't exist. So you're not listening to that when you're younger. You're listening to artists like Jimi Hendrix, yeah, or Alice Cooper, yeah, um, David Bowie, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, here's the thing. I always remember the first time we came to the states. Uh, people, you know, would ask the question. You know, for, first the first question was also always when I said this to you before. Why the cure? You know, and that, that was a terrible question. And then the next question was like, well, where, where does what do you call this music? And we said, Robert would always say, well, we, it's cure music. We yeah. don't call it anything else. You know, that it's not this, it's not that. It's what we do because all we did was process what we had, you know, witnessed and heard, and then try and play it. You know, my my friend. Um, James Murphy from LCD Sound System, he said something to me about that. It's like, you know, you, you, you start liking music and then you start to get obsessed by it and then you start to think, okay, well, maybe I can make it. I can make some music. And the way you do it is you try to copy the people that you really like. And what becomes your sound is how you get it wrong. Because you always get it wrong. Oh, You're never right. going to play it. You know, we love Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. I mean, we yeah. had no chance <laughs> to sound like Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, we became like, uh, really, people... If anybody really wanted to decide what we should call The Cure, I'm going to tell you right now, psychedelic punk band. That's what yeah, we were. Right. You know, and that's really, to a certain extent, probably still true. You know, we, we had all that impetus from the punk revolution, which kind of told us and informed us, hey, you guys can do it. You don't have to be like, you know, the end of the 70s, especially in England, was either disco or, um, you know, prog rock, like very overblown prog rock. And we'd sort of look at it and think, shit, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. But then, you know, we saw the Stranglers, who were like a local band. And then we saw Buzzcocks and The Clash and light bulb went off you know hey yeah i can do that i can do that so we we spent you know from 16 to 19 at robert's house three times a week writing our own stuff you know we probably couldn't play other people's stuff but we learned how to play our own stuff you know and that's really really how we started there yeah that story of you kind of ending up playing drums is a funny one right because you you tell the story in the book of where you don't really know how to play the drums at all. <laughs> no, you, not at all. It was yeah. sort of like, oh, well, lol, you'll play yeah. drums, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the whole point to us was it, it was, and I talked to Mike Dempsey about this recently because, you know, we're still good friends. Yeah. And uh, he said it was more a social thing as well as, you know, like learning to play music, you know, because we had the choice. Go to the local pub and and, you know, cross swords with the the skinheads you know who who weren't really our friends and or you know go up to robert's house because his parents had built this room they'd remodeled their house they put this extra room on the side of the house mm. and they said you know we're going to have it for parties and family get-togethers and we thought we could put our gear in there you know so so we could put so i moved my drums in i moved you know robert moved his guitar in and we didn't leave for three years you know they Wow, right, so, just literally kind of woodshedding playing. Yeah, over and yeah, over and, over. and we would go there three days a week, and we would go to the pub, you know, before the skinheads got there, and then come back and play and do that, you know, for three or four hours, three times a week. And so, you know, that old thing, that, you know, the, the Malcolm Gladwell's thing about, you know, the outliers, how, how you get good. Well, we got good by, really, it was down to the skinheads, you know. we 10,000 hours, we did our 10,000 hours in... Robert's uh, house. Yeah. Was there ever any uh, problem with the family who wanted to have the party in the room there, and you guys well, had taken, yeah, taken yeah. residence in yeah, there? Yeah, Christmas time we had to we had to sort of you know acquiesce and say, well, Move I suppose you bit. can have it, or, you know, you can have it over for you. But um, uh, you know, in the summertime, you know, they would they would sort of admit defeat and go, we're going on vacation, so 
Uh, we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Please don't destroy anything, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, and it, it was it was really very useful. And I, I kind of think to myself that Robert's uh, parents saw the writing on the wall and, and kind of thought, okay, well, at least they're here and they're not yeah, out there right. doing you know something. So it, it it worked for us, but. You know, somebody else said to me something the other day. I think, yeah, it was Horace from the specials. He said, two types of bands. There's bands that get together at school because they're friends. And there's bands like the specials who were like cherry picked because Jerry Dammers had this idea of, you know, oh, and this would make a great band. So he picked, you know, seven different people. Right, and put it together. Yeah. Uh, and The Cure was, was always a band made up of friends. And... Uh, you know, it's only really, I suppose, in the last few years that it's, it, you know, we sort of ran out of all the friends we had we knew that played something, you know, to put in it. I kind of love that idea of you guys being friends in high school and just, you know, playing the high school dance and these other things, uh, you know, as you're learning how to get in front of an audience. Because that yeah. was just kind of a slow process for you, too. You guys just kept trying it, right? Yeah, but we, we only actually really played the high school dance once because they'd never invited us back after the first <laughs> time, you know, they... They sort of, uh, I think Robert convinced the, the drama teacher, uh, Mr. Ward, Ron Ward, he convinced Ron Ward to do, you know, to let us play a show December the 20th, 1976, if my memory serves me correct. And, uh, you know, Ron, Ron was a very theatrical man and he was very interested in us having this show. And we did the show and he came in his tux and everything and he sort of left after the second song because I, I don't think it, you know, it wasn't very impressive, let me put it that it way. It wasn't meeting the standards of what he was No, no, no. <laughs> so after that, we didn't get allowed to do anything there more. But what we did after that was, you know, we lived in an area that was really like, it's the suburbs of London, you know, it's the suburbs are the same everywhere. You know, the Curious Music's proof of that. And... Um, so we would just like hire little halls ourselves and charge people to come in and make our own parties and play our own songs. And you know, eventually that kind of thing kind of worked. You, know. you end up playing in some of these other clubs and things like that too. I think you mentioned the Rocket uh, Club mm -hmm. a couple of times too. Mm -hmm. What was that? Was that sort of the next step up for you guys then? Well, we had a friend who had a, a, a sort of jazz rock fusion band and they, they were playing these gigs in in the rocket and they one of them got sick and they said oh well, we can't play you've got a band you know, why don't you play and so you know at the time i sort of assumed managerial role and called up the rocket and said uh, our friends can't play can we play and they're like well what do you play you uh, and we said well we play all these songs so we made up this imaginary list of um, cover songs because we knew that's what they'd want to hear you know but not songs that you actually played not at that point. <laughs> eventually, eventually we played them, including things like the Doobie Brothers. You oh, know, yeah. Robert won't admit to that, but I know, I know it's <laughs> but the there truth. There was a time, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and Jethro Tull, and all. yeah, we played a, a lot of different songs like that, and uh, miraculously it stuck. And then what we would do is they they'd invite us back, you know, like one Sunday a month or something, and we gradually sneak in our own songs, you know. And, and we figured we could sneak in more songs if we made each uh, sort of entry uh, like a three-piece song. So we'd have like these huge songs that lasted for about 15 minutes each, you know. And we'd say, well, is that, we only played one of our own songs, you know. It, we played all the other covers that you like. And, uh, but eventually, you know, we, we, got, we found our people and, the, and they came every week. And uh, eventually we played all our own stuff, so... Well. That's sort of a magical moment in a young band, right? When you, when suddenly an audience starts showing up to hear you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I witnessed that the other night here because uh, my my son, you know, mm -hmm. bless his bless his cotton socks, is following after his father's footsteps as as much as I try to dissuade him from it being a good idea. Um, but no, he's he's played here at uh, Grog Shop. Grog Shop, yeah. And uh, I watched that thing that you're talking about because. Uh, we'd seen him a month before they started the tour, and they they played in in Los Angeles where we live, and they they were yeah you know, they were good and practiced and everything, but now I saw the difference. I saw within a month they're getting the people that are coming because they've heard about them and they want to see them and they relate to them, and that's that's the 
the principle behind this place that we're sitting in. It's about relating to each other, relating to the music, and that that's the absolute reason for this place being here. And, and you know, every time you see that thing happen, I see it, you know, we watch other bands, and that you see that happening. Yeah. It's miraculous. I mean, I going back to that other band we were talking about, The Specials, I happened to see them. And, and <laughs> Horace told me a funny thing. He said, do you ever wonder why we were always on the same festival bills as The Cure? Because for, there was a period for about two years, every time we played a festival, they'd miraculously Specials turn up. Too, yeah. yeah. And he said it was well. He said we got to know you and like you. He said, but uh, initially it was because you were you were the only band that had a guitar tuner, right? So <laughs> so we, so we go okay. We're playing that festival because they've got a guitar tuner, so we'll be able to you know sound at least okay. sound decent for that yeah, show, right? Yeah. So they would come play with us. But I saw them play the Biltzen Festival in Belgium's 1979. They hadn't got their record out first. It was possibly one of the best concerts I've ever seen in my life. The place went completely nuts, mental, you know, and they were like it was like a riot, but like a friendly riot. Yeah. It was it was unbelievable. So, you know, it, when you get that thing, when that bit happens, that that's the the magical part of it. That's what makes you go, well, you know, maybe I could go and be a draftsman or something, you know, sorry if there's any draftsmen here, but <laughs> it's like that's the thing that propels you forward when you get that reaction. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that always, you know, that special moment. I think even for fans being in that audience, they can feel it when, you know, they're at a show and the audience is connecting with the artist. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> you guys are starting to think about, you know, recording a record and doing a record. And I'll have to admit, I told you this earlier, I was a fan of The Cure when I was in high school. And of course, you know, it was really cool to listen to Killing an Arab, the, one of the first singles you guys had done that based off the Albert Camus, The Stranger, yes. uh, the, the novel. Yeah. But there's a funny story about how you end up uh, going to record that for Hansa Records out yeah. of Germany. And it's, yeah. it kind of doesn't really work out for anybody, right? No, no. Well, I mean, you know, in their own way, Hansa, Ariola, they had... Uh, uh, they played a pivotal part in our, you know, start in that because yeah, up, yeah, because we, 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 we had seen uh, this advert on the back of the Melody Maker, you know, because back then the way we understood about music, the way we found out about it was two things: uh, listen to John Peel on yeah, on absolutely. the BBC late at night, ten o'clock, because he would play anything. I mean, you could be a local band and send him a tape, and he would play it. Um, and also the other way was like the music papers, the New Musical Express, Sounds, and Melody Maker. Uh, and I specifically got a job at the local news agents as a teenager so that I could read those papers because, you know, I would mark up the papers for the, the other kids to go and take them round to. Delivery rounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I would read them in between, you know, marking like, oh, this one has to go to number 27. And I'm like, okay, oh, okay. And I'd read some more. Um, so... I think, you know, the, the the thing about it was we, we saw this advert on the back of the Melody Maker. It said something like, get up off your ass," you know. And, and, you know, it was spelled A-S-S, which was not the way you spell it in England. So uh, we thought, oh, well, that seemed kind of intriguing. And we sent them a tape and a photograph. And, and strangely, almost immediately, we got a call back and they said, oh, come and see us up at this studio, which actually happened to be the studio we ended up recording uh, the first Cure album in, a strange twist of fate, and we went there and we did our audition, which was very kind of strange because it didn't seem that they actually recorded anything. They they filmed us like this, but they didn't actually record us. And so a week later, we got a call and said, oh, we'd like to talk to you about uh, signing a contract with us. And we're like, oh, you like the songs? And they went, songs? No. No, no, well, we just thought you looked good. And they wanted, they wanted like a... They wanted like another boy band, you know? Right. So we, we had a sort of um, endless stream of, of producers they would send us that would try to persuade us to play things like I Fought the Law and stuff. And and in between times, we would record our songs. When when the producer went out the studio, we'd put things... Sneak in a song or two. Yeah, sneak there. in a song or two. And it didn't really work out. And within, you know, we had a sort of year's contract. And before the year was out, we got summoned to the offices. And they're like, well, you know, we've had a listen to the stuff. And, and you haven't really tried, you know, to do the material you, we've sent you. Uh, and your songs, well, you know, not even people in prison 
would like that. <laughs> uh, bad like, songs for prisoners. For yes. bad songs for prisoners, <laughs> yes, yes. If you've been a, you know, accused of a bank robbery, then you might like this. But with, you know, and Robert actually was very smart, you know, because he he said to them, "Well, okay, sure, we'll go." Um, and they'd given us a, you know, a, a very small amount of money, and we'd bought our own PA and stuff out of it. And they said, uh, Robert said to them, "Well, can we have uh, our songs back, the rights to our own songs?" And they were like, "Really? You want the back? You know, like, but okay, sure, you know," and gave them to us. And then we sort of sat at home for a few months, you know feeling kind of sorry for ourselves. And, and Simon Gallup's brother, Rick, uh, worked in a local record store. He was our connection to the, you know, the good records that you could buy in London. You know, every week he would go up and, and get a, a whole bunch of things. Like I, I think he got me the, the for Anarchy in the UK. He, he got me a copy and wow. couldn't get it from anywhere else at the time, and he bought it for me. And so we would sit in the store and talk to him and play whatever else was coming out. And um, he said to us, uh, you know, after the Hansa deal, when we were sort of like, oh, we're never going to be in the music business, he said, well, I'm I'm sick of you sitting around, you know, being miserable. He said, here's 50, 50 pounds, go and make another demo, you know? And that was very generous of him because that was quite a lot of money back then. And um, that demo was the demo we sent. And, uh, of course, we got a million rejections, but Chris Parry. Picked yeah. Up. yeah. And those That's the uh, Chestnut Studio yes. ones, right? Which, if any of you know, the deluxe editions that came out a number of years ago, those demos were actually on there. And really cool to hear those early versions of the song. But Chris Parry is such an important part then yeah. because he's just from Polydor trying to start fiction records at that time, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he, had, uh, he had a band in New Zealand where he's from, and his band, you know, we we would uh, tease him about it because we find his old album covers where he had sort of you know psychedelic hair and stuff. <laughs> and were, but uh, and, we, and occasionally we would record the songs and and do our own versions of them to play at sound checks when he was there, so that we could see his, his reaction. reaction yeah, to his old yeah, because song. he'd be sitting in the theatre or something, and suddenly you'd see his head go. <laughs> that sounds oh, you bastard! You're playing my song. And so yeah, anyway, so he he do that and um, but. He was leaving Polydor to form his own label when we met him. And at first we were like, well, maybe we need to be on a bigger label. But it turned out really well, a good idea in the end, because, you know, I don't know, a lot of people, you know, that signed to like a big label, especially back then, they're having to compete with everything else that's going on. With fiction, you know, we were it really for the, for the first six months or so. and And if we had any problems you know me and Robert would go and see him and just, just talk to him so uh that was a much much better idea and he had uh you know faith enough to see that you know the cool thing too is when you finally end up recording uh three imaginary boys yeah. as the first album yeah uh that's where uh Mike Hedges comes in too right yeah to produce and yeah. that sort of relationship with Chris and Mike and you guys really becomes what drives you through those first several records right? yeah I mean Mike Hedges, it's funny. I, I, I met him because he was uh, in Los Angeles uh, like last year or the year before, I think. You know, and, uh, you know, now we're sort of like, we're all the same, more or less the same age, you know. But back then, Hedges to us was the old guy, you know. Okay, right. He was like t probably two years older than us. But he, but he was, was out ahead of you, right? Yeah, he was out ahead of us. And we're like, oh, okay, it's sort of mysterious, you know. We'll, just, we'll see what Mike's doing. And for the first album... And and Robert denies this, but I know it's true. He, he uh, we would record our songs and then sit at the back of the studio and watch Mike doing what he's doing because we didn't really, you know, have the knowledge there at that point. Oh, even as a way to learn a little bit about the yeah, recording process, yeah, to learn out how the yeah. studio is going. And um, so, but he was he was in a sort of pivotal point because he'd learnt how to you know be an engineer at a very good place. But a lot of new technology and stuff was coming out at that time, and and he was young enough to want to appreciate that and yeah. use it. So it's one of those things. There, there's there's few there's a few flashpoints in a musician's life, I think. And meeting Hedges and and Chris, Chris Chris's office was in the same complex as the studio. Oh, okay. So you know, it's like very often it's proximity that that drives something like this. And so we had Chris in his office there, and we had Hedges in the studio, 
and you know between the pair of them they they helped you know push the first album really out of us yeah. yeah and it's funny that first album i know roberts talked a lot about not liking the sound of that and you know mm. but there's something well, that's only because he didn't produce it that's why <laughs> right you know because that, it right? wasn't yeah. he didn't have yeah. control yeah. over it yeah. right yeah exactly but there's exactly. something that's really kind of raw and exciting about that record you can feel yeah. the energy of you guys just like you're getting it on tape finally, well we right? were yeah we were excited to do that part we were excited to have somebody that said oh rec record we'll record your songs what you want to play you know so that was good um yeah like i say robert really because he didn't have yet you know the full knowledge and didn't have the control over it yeah i think he looks back at it and sees some of the things thinks well i'd like to change this and like to change that but um I still have, you know, fondness for it. And it went on to better things because, you know, by the time we got to 17 seconds, uh, you know, we'd, we'd got up a bit more knowledge about how the whole thing worked and said to Chris, well, can we do it ourselves, you know, with Hedges? We'll just work with Hedges. And um, in fact, Robert said to him, well, yeah, you know, you can come along and listen to it, but, you know, if you want to leave with your ears bleeding or something like that, you know. And, and, <laughs> and he said, okay. And, and he would pop down maybe once a day from his office and just have a little listen. And it was going, he left, we left to our own devices, really. Yeah. I think there's, there's not that many back to back albums in rock history you can look at and, and see a band completely take what seems like a new path and new innovation from one album to the next. And I think between three imaginary boys and 17 seconds yeah. is that in rock history, that album is so unique and right. has such an incredible sound. The, the space in it, yeah. the sort of minimalism between the instruments, right. even your drumming, yeah. you know, on the first record, I can hear that psychedelic punk you're talking about by that second record. You're hitting a snare drum that echoes for yeah. ages. Right. Yeah. What There's, was that? Like, how did you come to, Okay. switching to that type of record. Well, there's, there's, there's a lot of things involved with that. First of all, there's the premise that a lot of times musicians are the only artists that are required, it seems, by circumstance to reproduce the, the same version of themselves again oh, and again. Right, you know what time I mean? over, yeah. It's uh -huh. like, yeah, you know, it doesn't sound like the first album. You know? It doesn't sound like the album we, we want to hear, you know, or the different album. But we weren't constrained by that because... We, we'd done the first album, which was basically our set that we'd done for a couple of years. You know, we just went in and played what we played in the show, and that was it. The second album, you know, Robert had got some demos that he'd done at home on his little organ, and he played them to me. Michael wasn't too keen on them, but I liked them, because I, I could hear that sort of... Once again, it's that combination of things. You know, my, my life... Was was kind of becoming a little not bleak, but it was it was I was understanding a lot of things about the world, and that combined with like the very simple minimalist stuff that he was doing, struck a chord with me. So I could start to write words and stuff. I could start to write the drum beats and that. Then when we got to the studio, Hedges had got this new microphone, like a seducer microphone, which just attaches to the rim of the drum. Oh, right. And isolates everything. So we just made everything very, very dry on the drums. And then, you know, we had like these huge reverbs. And, you know, 1977, Bowie's Low came out, which is a pivotal album. Amazing Actually, record, to, yeah. me, to me, that's his best album still. I mean, I, li I listen to it today still. And... Excuse me. And there was that, and there was the clash. So we put those two things together. And then Robert was listening to like people like Nick Drake, and those big sort of plaintive vocals, but with a lot of cello in the back, and, and this big hole in the middle. You know, like a lot of bands at that time, they had this sound that was like, you know, all frequencies of the spectrum are filled somewhere, you know. And for us, we decided, okay, we're like about 512 or whatever. We just take that way out and just leave these big holes so there's a lot of space and just let that move inside and that that would be where you get the emotion and the feeling from. And so, you know, that's what happened there. It, it's amazing. That funny, the way you describe it as the hole in the music, because I think that it's an incredible record, but it's also can sound unsettling sometimes. And I think yeah. if you almost, like you said, emotionally can tell that there's a, a space yeah. in there, right? Yeah, there's a, there's another thing though. I I would challenge anybody to listen to like one of their favorite records, and a lot of the time, 
you know, you listen to something and you think, well, it's very you know, complex or whatever. Maybe there's like two two things going on at any one time. You know, may, maybe a third thing, you know, in the best records, always, you know, and we were very aware of that. We thought like all the things we really liked had this, you know, like I take, for instance, Low, you know, it's yeah. got it's got Carlos Alomar and Dennis Davis, absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, uh, George Murray and just that trio, like, you know, the rhythm section and then Eno burbling over the top. And then Bowie's voice coming in, just like little words here and there. It sounds complex, but it's not really. But it's really uh, emotionally fulfilling, you know? Absolutely. You, When you talked in the book about this record, you said that The Cure could serve as a template for a kind of emotional therapy that you created this kind of sounds and fury for an audience to connect to the lyrics and the emotion of the record. Was that sort of a guiding light for you as you tried to make music? Were you thinking of that idea? Um, I, Fans to connect with the music that way? Yeah, I don't know so much that we were aware, but it's definitely 100% the, the guiding force for the thing. We never ever thought of the band as, uh, you know, oh, well, maybe we should do this as a career, you know. It, it was more about what do we feel today? What are we thinking about? How do we express it? And that's what we would put out. And that was definitely the way for at least the first five years. That was solely the reason for doing it. You know, every every other consideration was not really that important to us. We we wanted like, you know, the end of the seventies in England was was very uh, culturally important time, but. You know, you don't notice that when you're going through yeah, it. When it you're was, there, yeah, right. it was very, it was, it was very um, dark and, and crazy in lots of ways, and we just wanted a way to put out what we felt about it, and and that's why we we worked methods out to do it. You know, so the follow-up record in '81, of course, is Faith, yeah. and as we talked about earlier today, and you pointed out to me. Today, today is 41 years ago that that album came out. Isn't yeah. that amazing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me that I'm still here 41 years <laughs> later. <you know? laughs> right. Because <laughs> back then, I, I would think to myself, I, I'd say this to my wife, Cindy, a lot. Uh, uh, you know, at that age, you know, you think, ah, oh, I'm never going. I'm never going to be for. Yeah, 40, I'm never going to be 40. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was thinking at 40, 2000, the year 2000, I'd be 40. I'm not going to live that long, you know. And uh, then here we are, you know, and I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, you know, it, it was it was kind of a, a pivotal moment for that as well, you know. Like the first four albums of The Cure, you know, and I'm not just saying this because they're the ones I'm on, but um, we went through a lot of changes, but they were all changes that were inside of us to start with. They weren't. They weren't. There were never anything that was manufactured. You know. Right. We didn't sit there. It, me and Robert and Michael didn't have meetings like, well, you know, which existentialist poet are we going to read this week and and <laughs> write words around? It wasn't like that. You but know, you we, were reading existentialist yeah, poets. Yeah, <laughs> we were. But you know, it was more because my girlfriend at the time, her mother was French, and she had a whole shelf full of existentialist poets. So every time I was there, I would just like oh, pull okay, one down yeah, and read it. So. You know, and Robert was studying it at college. So, uh, you know, it was a natural thing for us. So, um, you know, I mean, I think Tim Pope had it right when he said that The Cure are like the, the stupidest band I've ever met and also the most the most intelligent band. Mm -hmm. You know, we veered from, you know, uh, you know, both extremes, really. And somewhere in the middle is where you find us, you know. I think faith for me is a. It feels like you guys took what you did on seventeen seconds and you you sort of ratcheted everything up a little bit. You kind of took it to the next step. Right? Well, life life ratcheted up for us because my my mother died, and yeah. that was very hard for me at that point. I mean, it's hard I think for anybody, but it was like, you know, I wasn't I wasn't physically there the day that she passed away, and so it, you know, I was on the road. And I saw yeah. her a month beforehand. Things like that, you know, made it very emotionally hard. And Robert's grandmother died, so we had a, you know, we we, you know, and like I say, we were all brought up, you know, Roman Catholic, you know, which is all fire and brimstone, and right. you know, and and you think about it, you know, 
some of the iconography of, of the Catholicism is very Gothic anyway as well. So, you know, we had all that and we were young men and we had those feelings to deal with. So faith is where we dealt with it there. You know, that, that's our diary right there in faith. Now, we talked a little bit about playing live in the early days. So now you've gotten through the yeah. first three records. And by now you're out on the road playing, you know, with Generation X, with Billy Idol and yeah. the guys. You're playing yeah. with Susie and the Banshees. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to take this new music you've developed and find a way to do it live. So yeah. how did how did those moments sort of playing with other bands in the scene uh, and playing this new yeah. music work out for I th you? I think, you know, there were, there were different things because, like, you know, the, th the thing with Generation X was kind of our first introduction to showbiz, you know, because it was definitely showbiz, you know, <laughs> right. they're, they're like, they're a punk band, but dressed quite, you know, resplendently, one has to say, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's showbiz, it was very much showbiz, and, you know, we didn't last that long because there was a particular incident that's, you know, uh, it's in the book, if anyone in my book, read it, yeah. yes. <laughs> and uh, we won't rehash it here. But uh, but it's funny, you know, every time I come across Billy, I, you know, he, he kind of yeah. looks at me, he gives his funny look like, yeah, I remember. He has a memory of that yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but he's a lovely fellow. But anyway, um, it was bands like Wire. We opened for Wire, you know. Yeah, and great that, band. That made a, a, an immense impression on me. You know, I, I remember we played at Kent University or something in in uh, Canterbury in England. And I remember coming to the gig, you know, sound check, and we're this tiny little band with, you know, a little truck with our gear in. And I'm looking at the band, and I'm thinking, well, they all look kind of normal. And then the bass player turned around, and he had this huge rat tail hanging down the back, and it was like, wow, it does not compute. You know, it's, it's like, here's a very normal-looking man, and then he's completely weird from the other way. And I was thinking... That's so strange to me, you know, growing up in, you know, nice middle-class suburban England. And then uh, when they played, it was a revelation as well because they were, you know, things were very insistent. And uh, I think um, the singer, Colin, had a, had a syndrome, you know, under his arm that he was banging oh, like, this, yeah. like a talking drum. You know, it was like an African talking drum, except it was an electronic thing. And I'd never seen one, you know, so I went out and got two straight away because I thought that was a great great sound, you know, and I use that on a lot of the next records, but just to see them who were definitely, you know, they were punk, but they were art, you know, they were art writ big. So so we thought, okay, we can we can do something that's you know, has some of that bit in there. But then the main thing came when we met the Banshees, you know, because we we had uh I think we've been to London, we've been hanging out and stuff, and I think we met Steve uh, Severin and he's like well we're going on tour I think you should be our opening band and we're like okay fine you know uh, it was a complete revelation to watch the Banshees I mean you know the first part of the tour was, was kind of difficult because the, the drummer and the guitarist ran off after the second show um, but we kind of bonded over that a bit because we were like you know partners in adversity and then the band formed back together again and it had my good That's partner, Budgie, in there, right? yeah, who we voted in instantly. You know, we, we said, oh, you, you've got to get him. Is that right? Well. Stood up for him and said he's the right guy for the band. Yeah, it's sort of like that. I mean, what happened was it was actually more, you know, like uh, auditions for the guitarist. You yeah. Know, that we, 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 we had a hand in that, definitely. Like, so, you know, we'd say, Bob, you can go do it. Um, but what I always got from them, because I watched every single show of, of the Join Hands tour from the side of the stage, was like Sue completely, you know, it's a complete revelation. I mean, I think of her as, as as a true feminist punk icon, you know, because she had such a lot of power just on stage and she wasn't doing something that was normal. She didn't sing like a normal person. She she had her own style completely and utterly. And, you know, let's be honest, she had a lot of um, you know, overt or, or maybe not so overt sexism and all the rest of it was in the business at the time to deal with, you know? And she dealt with it very well, usually by punching people, but, um, <laughs> you know, but she always liked me, so it was okay. Um, but, you know, that power of that, and then their presentation was very stark, yeah. and, they, you know, it, it was very hard, but it was beautiful. And 
So you know th th those those early shows with people like that were were very informative to us. You know. Yeah. Well, we have to talk about the next record from A2, which is Pornography, which again to me is another incredible shift in the sound of the band. I mean, your drums, as opposed to the sort of sparse textures, are so um, in your face on that record. I mean, right. I think the drums are really out front for a lot of it. It's got a, yeah. a sort of almost a tribal sense to a lot of the yeah. music that's coming out of that record. Well, I, I read this thing the other day. Somebody put on one of our socials. Uh, you know, it's the only album that they'd heard at that time that had the drums as the lead instrument. Mm. And I never really thought about it that right. way, but that, uh, listening to it, I can see that. It's actually my favorite album that we did as a three-piece because, uh, you know, a three-piece band, you you have no room, especially, you know, um, in the studio, but, but in, even live, you have no room for mistakes, you know, because if one of you makes a mistake... Everything falls apart. Yeah, yeah. everything <laughs> falls apart and it's right there, you know, and especially if you're the drummer, you know. And so that was a kind of discipline to be able to do something very, very rigid but moving. And um, for me, like I said, that was the pinnacle album for me of the three piece. But what happened was we decided, okay, uh, Mike Hedges, we've done three albums with him. Uh, we need a change. So we... we Met with Connie Plank, you know. Oh, the great Connie Plank. Yeah, the great Connie Plank. Worked with Kraftwerk and Noi yeah. and all those yeah. bands. Yeah. yeah. So we, we met with Connie Plank, me and Robert, in Fiction's office, and he came, and he was this big, tall German man dressed head to toe in black leather. Right? <laughs> and he came and sat in front of me and Robert, and he said, I have just finished an album with Killing Joke, and the sound, it is like an animal. It's like an animal. This is what we have to make. And and we were impressed, you know. We were like, ah, yeah, that's hey, impressive, yeah, right? Yeah, you, we get it. We want to make a sound, an album with a sound like the animal. Things didn't quite work out, and eventually he passed away. But, um, you know, it, we would have that would have been a good combination. I think. Yeah, a Cure album with Connie producing would yeah, have been very interesting, yeah. right? So, but in the end, we, we heard about this guy, Phil Thornley. Amazingly, I realized this the other day, because Phil wrote to me and said, you know, we, we're still attached by this ever thinning thread. He, he said, uh, he was 21 when he made pornography with us, because we were only wow. 23. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that blows my mind if I think back about it now. But um, we, we, we liked him the second we met him, and he worked at Rack Studios, which I don't know if you know, is like used to be owned by Mickey Most, who was like a, a very you know, famous pop, producer really in lots of ways but he'd also worked with Led Zeppelin and things and during the pornography sessions he came down from his he had like this big ear he stuck somewhere around the complex he came down with this guitar and and said I want you to use this you know he was listening to the song and said, I want you to lose and it was the guitar that Jimmy Page had used on Stairway to Heaven Oh, so wow. it's like, yeah, we're like, oh, okay, we know who that is, so we'll use it. Did he get you used it on the record? Yeah, yeah, Whoa. yeah. But so he, you know, but he was kind of bemused by us because you know everybody else came to the studio. Like Kim Wilde was there, and she would come to the studio, and the Baker Gervitz Army, if anybody remembers them. Anyway, everybody else would come to the studio at ten in the morning, and we turn up about six in the evening, you know, okay, and, right. and and work through the night, and then and then you know possibly I would meet. Kim Wilde on the way out, that she was coming in and I was I was going home to bed, you know, and I was fairly deranged. You know, I, I, I have never talked to her about that, you know. That it, I must have been shocking, you know, like meet this madman every morning, you know, like, hi, Kim! You know, so like, um, but um, that whole album was quite hard emotionally to make because, you know, all this death had happened. Yeah. And um, so, you know, uh, Phil's a big fan of uh, Todd Rundgren. So he said, well, why don't we put the drums in the room and take out all the padding, all the baffling, and just have this huge, big drum sound. And I'm like, yep, okay, I can go with that. Yeah, right. And so we were in the rack number one studio, and the room's about the size of this room here. And uh, so it did all the drums in that, and they just sound like, you know, hammers, right? And that was great. And then they said, okay, well, you should overdub some symbols, perhaps. And Rack had this room that wasn't finished yet. Like, it was very popular in the late 70s, early 80s to make rock rooms. So there were literally rooms 
covered with rock, so the, the sound oh, would be very right. hard. Rack had made a rock room, but it wasn't finished. It was just like this big concrete bunker. And I would, <laughs> I would go in there, and I'd bought this Chinese symbol from Ray Mann's oh, in God. London, right? And I put it in a room with a mic and headphones, and hit this thing, and it was it was the loudest thing you've ever heard. I used to have to turn my head the other way, you know, and Phil would record it, and put it, so that's what's on the record. It's like that power of it. Yeah. yeah, you can definitely hear it in the drums. That sort of yeah. Like you said I can imagine that China symbol in a concrete yeah, yeah. room, literally being almost deafening because all the overtones. It was. It was completely bouncing deafening. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, you know, that was what got that sound. You mentioned, of course, that album being hard to make and and a lot of the emotion that was going on of course you know the first line of the record it doesn't matter if we all die right yeah and then, i think that was part of what we were feeling yeah yeah i mean it hits yeah. you immediately yeah i wanted to read a, a short quote um that i asked you about earlier right um from your book cured and i think it it, it has some relation potentially to this record and some of what you guys were trying to do and if you don't mind i'll read it to the yeah. audience here so this is from cured i have a theory there comes a day when every single one of us is confronted with the abyss. Sometimes it's a heart-wrenching breakup. Sometimes it's the loss of a loved one. Some have it early, and some people get it late. But we all have that moment when we look down, and there's nothing fucking there. People want their rock stars to go further out on the edge and hang out there for a bit, take a good long look at that abyss, and then transmit what they find there through their art. Yeah. I love that paragraph. Thank you. Thank um, you. It's a really fascinating way to think about art that you are pushing to the edge and staring down in the abyss for the rest of us in a way, right? Right, right. And that's that's actually the, the, the idea behind it. Because I, I remember, um, you know, at the time there was the other band, Joy Division, right? Great group. And wow. I met Ian, you know, because they opened oh, for wow. us one night at, at the Marquee. And we, we had arranged like a... A set of concerts, like a month of Sundays or something, or a dose of I can't remember what we called it, but um, every Sunday we would come back off to and play the Marquee in London, which you know a very famous club. Everybody's played there, and we chose all the opening acts, and I'm still in touch with a couple of them anyway. But um, Joy Division opened for us, and I remember seeing it and thinking, "Wow, that's that's very powerful, and there's something going on there." And then about a couple of months later, just before he passed away, I saw him again, and it was like, kind of, he was looking into the abyss, you know? And, and I could feel it. I mean, he was pushed out there to the end. And the thought occurred to me that, like, you know, a lot of the time, you know, life life goes on, you know, in a predictable fashion. But every so often, you know, something comes out and just pushes you like this, right there. And what you do with it and how you deal with it is how you stay alive, you know, and he couldn't, right? So that's what happened. And to a greater or lesser extent, we're, we're not the scapegoats for society, but we are the, the you know, the, the sort of like, the, not the shaman, even, but somebody gets driven out into the desert for the rest of society yeah, right. to, to experience it. And about that time when we were doing, I really got the feeling of that. It's like, you know, because normal people don't live the life that we lived at that point, you know? And yes, we chose it, but also we didn't have much choice, you know? We were we were compelled to go on. And well, you know, I, I've seen that in Robert, and I've seen it in Ian Curtis, and I've seen it in, you know, other people since then, Kurt Cobain being one, right? But um, that's the bargain that you make, you know? That's what you have to agree to if you're going to do it you know because if you're not prepared it's like writing you know when i wrote my my memoir cured there came a point you know at the beginning i was very scared you know my my literary agent would call me up and go you know hey, well have you got something to send me yet and i'm like oh yeah soon peter sue because i was scared yeah you know am i going to reveal too much reveal me you know and then I realized, you know what? You have to. You have to be you and you have to be honest because otherwise it's not going to be believable. Nobody will read it and they won't engage with it. Same is true of music, you know? Unless you're, unless you're really you, you know, it's not believable. And uh, that's really what that, that 
paragraph's about. Yeah. I'll say, too, about the book, I found, I think what you just said, I, I found that as a reader myself. Uh, <clears throat> it's not a book that says, we arrived at the studio at 4 o'clock, I played a snare drum. I mean, there's some yeah. of that in there. but there's some of that. But yeah. mainly, it's a story about you and the music and the, the, the journey you take emotionally and personally yeah. through it, right? Yeah. And, I mean, that's that's what interests me. You know, I mean, I did a book tour for the last few years, you know, uh, and, you know, mostly people understood that but occasionally you know i get somebody who and i and i don't denigrate this in any way because i understand why people want to know this but they would say so what snare drum was it you were using on this track and you know which set of symbols and i go i don't remember <laughs> i've not got the slightest idea it's whatever we had around or whatever i was yeah, using right. at the time and and you know i get it that people want to know that details and and people would say like I've heard the demo of this song and the melody line is completely different than the one that was on it at the end. And I said, yeah, because we just decided we didn't like that and took it out and played something else. <laughs> right. and, pe and it blows people's minds because they think that you write songs, you know, like fully formed, mm. fully done, and you know exactly how you did it and what you did on it. Most of the times when you make good music, you've no fucking idea how you did it. <laughs> Really, don't let anybody else tell you that they do. They know, oh, yes, see, I was dead certain about that. Because you have to be the conduit. You have to be the conduit yeah. for what is coming through you, the creation. And the trick is to know when it's coming and go, okay, switch the, you know, the laptop as it is now. Switch that on, you know, switch the tape machine on, get it down because, you know, it could be gone. I mean, people often say, you know, they say, well, will you write this? I say, well, it took 10 minutes and people think they're lying. No, because there are some points in time when you hit the the right thing, and it's like, oh my God, this is it. Let's yeah, let's just record it now, and and you sing whatever over it, and then come back and fix it later. Yeah, and and I apply the same technique to writing. You know, I sit down most mornings and I go, okay, right, and I put it down, and whatever comes out, you know, sometimes it's crap, sometimes it's great, usually it's somewhere in between. And then, you know, a week or two later, I'll look at it again and go, okay, I can edit that and yeah, change this. And bits, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a cre the creative process has always been like that, you know, for a lot of people and definitely for me. Yeah. Well, thinking about The Cure then after the first four albums, it start, that's when things start to change a bit. Oh, yeah. uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, you're, you're obviously getting a lot of fame by that point. You're, you know, getting infamy. into... Infamy. Infamy. Infamy, <laughs> yeah. yes, that's right. You're yeah. getting into a period where MTV's coming around and you guys are yeah. being in that image of yeah. the cure, right? And that's yeah. after pornography is very yeah. specific. Yeah. There's also a period here where, and you do talk about this in the book, where clearly Robert is the one moving out front now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, the band is, it starts to be a different band than what you had. In well, the it, it's, it starts to, you know, all the time you're doing it for yourself and, and maybe there's a little coterie of people that know about you. It's very controllable. But uh, at some point, you know, it steps out and, you know, commerce's ugly head rears itself, you know, and, and, and you, you become prey to all kinds of things. I really think a lot of, a lot of bands, you know, like as I'd say for the first four or five years we were going, we were like playing, you know, maybe two hundred shows a year sometimes, and then oh, you got two months, let's make an album, you know, yeah, uh, right. and that destroys a lot of bands. You know, if it, somebody had said to us at the time, just take two months off, don't do anything, just go home and do nothing, you know, things things would have got perhaps you know some different stuff would have come out, perhaps things would have wouldn't have got as crazy as they got, you know, so. But you don't know that at the time. Um, for us, you know, we came here and MTV, strange bedfellows, you know, but we had videos. We had videos that like uh, Tim Pope had made. And at the time, you know, uh, MTV only had like six videos a week. Right. So they would play so them they, a lot, So they had right? to play us, you know, <laughs> it didn't matter. So right. we put those strange English guys with makeup and funny hair. Yeah, we got to put them on because we haven't got any other ones, you know. And that changed rapidly, obviously. But that was, you know, we were we were doing MTV when they were in Hell's Kitchen in this room that was about a third of the size of this room, yeah, you know. Right. So, um, you know, that helped us because it it changed the dynamic overnight, you know. Because before then, 
And, you know, I, I, I cast no aspersions about serious young men because I was a serious young man. But, we, you know, we'd be playing and there's always one guy out there looking at how you're doing stuff exactly, very intently, you know. And it's it's okay, but it's a bit, it can be a bit off-putting. So sometimes we'd throw in little things and pretend, you know, like, you know, just... <laughs> oh, that's just, how he yeah, does it. Yeah, so, so, you know, just to confuse people. <laughs> right. But... Um, but after MTV and, and you know, some videos and stuff, things changed rapidly and we'd start to have concerts with, you know, there were still the serious young men at the back, but there was a whole bunch of girls, screaming girls, which was kind of, you know, it's kind of nice if you're a young man. Um, but, um, you know, it changed quite a bit, you know. And you changed the instrument you played in the band, which yeah. is an interesting story, right? Because not a lot of musicians do that in their career. No. And just like you kind of found your way into the drums in the beginning, you now found your way out from behind the drum set to the keyboards. Yeah, well, I was always, I always wanted to be out front anyway. You know, that was, you know, I loved Keith Moon because Keith Moon was out front with not being out front. Yeah, yeah right, you totally. know, it was like that, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, I've been watching the exhibitions here today and I realized something, you know, uh, English drummers owe uh, a depth of gratitude to Ringo because we all have something from Ringo. Budgie will tell you this, and and Charlie, but also Keith Moon. But you know, those are the three that outlined our path. But I wanted to be out front. But I also the overriding thing was I was not wedded to the idea of what I should play. Obviously, from the beginning, you know, I, as you play drums, yeah, okay, I play drums. Um, I love drums. I still love them. I'm learning like taiko, you know, Japanese drumming now oh, and stuff. Yeah, and really and it's, it's a wonderful instrument, especially when you're older, because, you know, you think, oh, I can still do that, you know. Um, there's a kind of grace in the form of playing. Yeah, too, there's right? grace in the form of the playing. And, um, you know, you, you know how to do things without, you know, giving yourself a hernia. But, <laughs> right. um, yeah, but uh, I... I think back then it was like, okay, well, there was only two of us at that point, right? Right. So I was like, okay, well, you're singing and playing guitar. I like a lot of the new electronic things of doing things coming up. Maybe I should take that. Okay. So, you know, I can learn how to program a drum machine. I wasn't scared of drum machines. I wasn't like, oh, that's a bad thing. I was like, who should program a drum machine but the drummer? You know, right. because Makes sense. Yeah, because, you know, it's like it's like when you watch guitarists play dr real drums, you know, they always play them like Paul McCartney, like sort of and then come back into the song. It's, there's no flow about it. They can do the techniques, yeah, but right. you know, it's no flow. And the same with drum machines, you know, people who don't play drums put f six or seven things going on at the same time and I'm like, mm, yeah. Haven't got five hands, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't sound realistic. So I was like, okay, I'm going to program the drum machine. I'm going to program the sequences. All of that stuff, it interested me. And so that's why I swapped. And I, I didn't have, I wasn't precious about what I did because it was like, I will do what we have to do to make our music, you know. And you were getting to play some really cool synthesizers. I know you were using oh, like yeah. a Synclavier and some oh, yeah. really early. I mean, yeah. that was a good time, sort yeah. of that mid '80s to be it playing. It was an amazing time, you know. In London, uh, Peter Gabriel, who you know I admired and stuff, uh, had a store in the middle of London, his own store called Psycho, and you couldn't walk into this store. You know, you had to go have an appointment, and he had a couple of floors of of like large Bosendorfer pianos, you know, with beautiful artwork and things around the side. And then he also had a couple of rooms with, like, you know, Synclavia emulators, all kinds oh, of stuff wow, like that. Yeah. So you could go there and try them out and, uh, you know, talk to other people who were, like, on the cutting edge of what it was at the time. You know, sampling technology was not in your laptop. It was there, you know. So uh, he really pushed that, you know, the envelope for people. So I would go there all the time and... Uh, you know, it was very interesting to me. You mentioned the way you thought about using the drum machine as a drummer. Yeah. But being a keyboard player yeah. opens up some different things. And there's a lot of really cool keyboard parts on those records. You know, Head on a yeah. Door, The Top, yeah. uh, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff. Yeah. Was that not, not all mine, I hasten to add. Right, no. because there's a lot of... Different yeah. people, even Robert. Yeah, Robert plays. Some, plays right? yeah, yeah, Robert plays. Well, Pearl Thompson plays. Yeah. Pearl Thompson is the best musician the Cure ever had because Pearl Thompson 
can play anything. You know, he's one of those people you hate because of that. You know, just you, too yeah, good. If you gave, yeah, if you gave him a tuba, you know, he'd get a tune out of it in about three minutes. You know, and so, uh, you know, for for me, it's like you look at the orchestra. You know, you have the timpani in the back and the piano's next to it. So going to a keyboard was a natural progression because it's it's a rhythm instrument. You know, right. I understand it. You know, it, it doesn't. You know. It doesn't uh, require me to learn how to get a certain tone out of the strings, and that, you know, it's like okay, there's the note, yeah, bang, percussive. you know, right. it's louder, or softer. Uh, I was more interested in the sound, you know, like to, because some of those synthesizers, they you know, blew your mind that it stuff you could get the sound. You're like, hey, we don't need a string section; we could do it ourselves. Yeah, right, Here. you can play right on this, right? Yeah. So that's what I was interested in. Um. By the time you guys get to Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me in 87, yeah. the sort of original deal with Fiction was done. Yeah. You guys decide to stay with Chris. But, yeah. th- but that's really where, for you, the, your sort of time in the band starts yeah. to fizzle out, right? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's no surprise, I would imagine, to lots of people. But, you know, a, a lot of musicians are, are less than stable mentally and uh, you know it's a flip side of the coin you know what makes you really good at doing something is also the thing that can destroy you yeah right so you know we were on the road for years and years and years and uh, anybody who's ever been that journey will tell you you know it's closer than being married and and you know there, there are pressures that you don't get to experience in normal life that's not and you're with your bandmates 24 hours 24 a day hours a day right? yes Week in, week out, month in, month out. I mean, I think at one point I did two 18-month tours, world tours, back-to-back, you know, with maybe a couple of weeks here and there. Uh, and, you know, it, it can make little things become very, very big, you know. Um, so I think that combined with the fact most are touring, you know, and I, I don't say this, you know, in a way to in, elicit any um, sympathy. Most of touring is deadly boring, the, the the only exciting part of touring is the time you're on stage playing. Right. That that is the reward every day. But the rest of it is like long journeys, you know, in the bus, on the plane, whatever. Uh, and so, you know, other activities come up and for me it was drinking and you know, and there and you know, obviously anybody anybody who's ever been in a band and says there were no groupies and there were no drugs. It's lying, right? <laughs> They're all lying. They're all lying because that's that happens immediately. You know, no matter what happens, uh, other you know, you can be the Osmonds, and I'm sure you know it's like. Right. But um, so at that point, when when we started to do, you know, kiss me, and it was the end of our first original deal. You know, yeah, I w- I was getting less reliable in my uh, mind and everything else, and. Um, yeah, you know, it came to a head then. I think really because you know, otherwise it wouldn't have continued. You know, it wouldn't have continued, and I was interested in it continuing. You know, I mean, on reflection, there are some things I wish that I had done differently. But you cannot go back. You know, That's it's right. po- yeah. pointless. Pointless. You know, you you you're here now, so um, things happened. And over the years. Even after you left, and you know, with the album disintegration, they moved on without you. You left the right. band, but you did end up, you know, kind of reconnecting for reunion shows, and yeah. then, and then, of course, I have to say, getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, they are, they are. Thank you very much. We'll clap thank for you. that for sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, you know, my one regret about that is that my my mother wasn't alive to see it because yeah. she would like she had a warm. The T-shirt with it on for a year <laughs> solid. I know it, right? Um, Mother of a uh, Hall of Fame yeah, inductee, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. She, she would, she would have done that for sure. And um, you know, so that that was good. But it's, um, yeah, you know, things things change. Um, eventually, you know, I got better and got well again. You know, anybody knows. Read this little badge; it will tell you about it. Um, there's a way forward, and you know, Robert and everybody in the cure, they were my family. You know, that to a greater or lesser extent, you know, I will know them till the day I die, they will know me, and that's where that's where this whole thing came from. The fact that we were outsiders in that small town 
in you know, southern England, and this is how we navigated life, which is what this whole museum's about. But yeah. um, we navigated it with the music, you know, things came apart. And then, you know, I wrote to Robert and, you know, we sorted some things out. And that was good, you know, I, I sorted that side of it out and I wasn't really thinking of anything. And then I, I said to him, oh, actually, it's funny because it's like today. I said, oh, this is the, it was probably the 30th anniversary of Faith coming up. I said, it'd be, it'd be kind of fun if we went and played some of those old songs. Yeah. I, I said, you know, because I'd been on tour to Europe with, with my band, Levenhurst, with my wife and, and Michael Dempsey. And we'd played a couple of the old songs and things, and you know, it was nice, it was good fun. And I didn't hear anything from Robert for a, a couple of months, and I thought, oh, he's not interested, he doesn't want to do it. And then he came back and he said, oh, well, why don't we do the first three albums? I'm like, okay. And then he said, but why don't we do it in Australia so if it all goes horribly wrong, nobody will know. <laughs> right? so, so I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so you know, I went from my home in Los Angeles and went to Brighton for like a couple of weeks and we worked through all the songs. And it was so weird, you know, because I walked into the rehearsal room and everybody's there. And I just got off the plane from LA, you know, so I'm, I'm jet lagged. Pretty but I'm, jet lagged, yeah. Yeah, but I'm not that jet lagged because they flew me first class. So I had got to sleep and everything. <laughs> and then they picked me up in this nice car. and But I'm, you know, rehearsing. But you know what? Music has power to rejuvenate yeah. you, you know, and within 10 minutes of sitting in there, it's like never finished, you know, never stopped. It was just like riding a bike. I'm Is like, right? okay, yeah. yeah, know what to do. And, you know, it, it's just, I've got a better quality bike now, you know, and yeah, right. um, so, so that was good, but, but someone so, else to carry the gear. Yeah. Someone you, else right? carry the gear <laughs> right. and, and fix it. And, you know, it's fine. And uh, a nicer place to stay, but, um, we did the first couple of shows for Reflections down in Sydney. And then, you know, I think Robert called me backstage and I was looking a bit glum because I was thinking, oh, well, you know, that's it, two shows. You know, He says, don't worry, we're going to do some more. So, Good. Okay. And then we did like, I don't know, five, seven more, something like that. I can't remember. We did uh, New York, LA, London. And it was great. And it was really a really nice way to put things together. And then... You know, life life rolls on, and I got a I got an email from uh, from Joel here. Yeah, Joel Parisman. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and he had been he'd worked for our agent Wayne Forty back in the eighties. Oh, yeah, really? in New York. Yeah, so that's how I, I knew him. Okay. And he said to me, "This is great because you know I'm invested heavily in the band, and obviously you know I am the boss here. <laughs> so you know it it would be really good if you do this." And I by the, that time I had lived in California longer than I'd lived anywhere else in my whole life. I lived there, I've lived there 20, 27 years now? Yeah, 27 years. So, yeah. um, you know, I'd like, you know, and I actually, you know, my passport says I'm an American, right? Uh, since 2006, but you know, don't sound like it. I always tell people that old Stan Laurel joke. They ask me where I'm from. I go, I'm from the South. And they go, really? Yeah, I'm from the South, South of London. <laughs> and, um, but so, you know, they, Joel said to me, it'd be really great if you could do the thing, you know, and we want you to come in that. And, and so I, I called Robert up and I said, you know, this would be a really good thing to do. And he was like, he was a little skeptical at first. He was like, well, I don't know, it's like an award show, isn't it a bit hokey and that? I said, no. I said, all the people that we met back in the day out in the Midwest, I said, they would absolutely love it. I said, because... You know, they were growing up and they heard us on the radio or whatever, or they drove for, you know, 20 hours to come and see us. And they got something from it that they got from nobody else. And, you know, they were running around escaping the metal heads or whatever in their town or the jocks. And it was, you know, I said, they would absolutely love that we're here to do this. And he went, oh, I'm not sure, but um, okay, you know, and, and he agreed to do it. And and my my best moments of that whole night was when Trent Reznor got up on stage, yeah. you know. And I I'd asked, you know, been asked, you know, who should we induct? And I said, well, Trent seems to be, you know, that's a good connection. And he got up and he said, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania and uh, you know uh, just cornfields and I could hear the radio and the Cure came in and saved my life. And I looked at Rob and I went, yes, that that's what I told you, 
You know? That's the kid I was talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. the kid I was talking about. Now he's got a band. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's the truth of things. And I know that Robert liked doing it very much, you know, and... Uh, well, and I'll tell you, I was in the audience that night too, yeah. and the eruption in the crowd when yeah, you guys great, came on stage it? was it was, great. was unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I get goosebumps <laughs> just thinking about the energy was yeah. so high yeah. to see all of you guys, you know, from the different eras of the band to be up there too. I got to tell you, you just reminded me of something. The thing that really, really blew my mind was when it finishes. You know, they they have like these, they have like th three ladies with with headphones and clipboards on that, you know. Ch chaperone you around the, the 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 show all night long, and at the end, you know, we we sort of managed to escape before Def Leppard, but um, we got got down into the place, you know, and and we said we we, we can go now, right? And they like, yes, you know, we'll we'll get the a car to come around the front, and we'll walk you out the front, but you you know you have to be careful because like there's barriers and everybody's there, you know, so you have to sort of stand back here. And I'd had a lovely evening. I got to meet some of my, my childhood heroes, you know, the night before that thing, this is, I digress a little bit, but don't worry, I'll get to the end of the story. Um, night before, they have a big dinner, you know, for all the inductees and you can go to it. So I went to it and I was telling somebody the story about how when I was like 13, I loved the zombies and especially Colin Blunstone because he wrote lyrics that I could see were not sappy, they were not misogynistic, they were very emotional lyrics that meant something, you know? And so that gave me something. And as I was telling this person the story, they said, well, you know, Colin's just standing over there at the bar. So I went up to him and slung my arm around him and said, I'm, you know, you're part of the reason that I'm here with you tonight. And he looked aghast like, you know, he was gonna get <laughs> mugged or something. And, and, uh, and, uh, and he, he said, oh, wow. And I told him the whole story. And he was like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. That's, that's great. That's great. You know, and on the way up to, for the zombies to get the thing, I gave him a big hug. And it, it was nice to me because, you know, I was able to be a fan for a second and acknowledge what was going on. And so I, 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 and I thought it would be like that for me for Roxy Music, but it wasn't, you know, because they didn't have Phil Manson era. So, um, but, for, you know, him, it was great, but anyway, we got out afterwards, and they said, okay, c we'll come out the front, the car will be here in a few minutes, just stand outside there. And th this was the point, this was the point where I realized, yeah, you've done it, right? Because we stepped out the door, and there's two of New York's finest standing at the door, right? They got like, you know, submachine guns and stuff, you know, they, they, serious they like, business, serious right? shit, yeah, serious <laughs> shit, right? And one of them turns around to me and Michael, and he go, they go, hey, The Cure, we love The Cure, you know? Uh, we have a picture? And they took a picture with us, you know? <laughs> and I, I was like having this out of body experience. I was thinking, God, I remember there's a picture of us walking down Columbus or something in, you know, 1980, and the cops are looking at us like, who are these weirdos? Yeah, yeah, right. You know, and it's like, fast forward, and it's like, yeah, you know, we're like you're policemen, right? You're 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 not SWAT army people or something, <laughs> right, are you? Right. You're like, no, we're policemen and we love you. Mm. And we're like, oh my god, it was like me and Michael were just. Gr Michael wanted had to have a picture taken with them as well. You know, he was like, I can't believe this. You know, <laughs> this like, like, that's yeah, right. right. <laughs> you know? And they were younger. They weren't. They weren't yeah. same age as us. They were like maybe you know thirty five, forty. But it was it was kind of amazing. So that was a good thing. Absolutely. In fact, I have to say, just as an aside, at that dinner with the zombies the night before inductions, I was the one who interviewed them, and th they could not be more incredible. What an incredible group of gentlemen. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Rod Argent, just an incredible piano player and a, a yeah. perfect gentleman, too. That was funny, because we met them backstage as well after, yeah. and, and uh, Michael was going to, to Rod, because there was a period in time where Rod Argent had a keyboard shop in London called oh. Argent's, right? Yeah, right. So so Michael was like, hey, I remember coming to your store, and for a minute, you know, this this look past his face like, oh, did he have a bad keyboard that <laughs> I sold I him you, or yeah. something? Yeah, you know, it was <laughs> like that. But no, they were very nice, very, very good. And that, and I really, Mike, because they sounded very good that night. They really did. They, they yeah. really did, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you mentioned Levenhurst, of course, yes. your band, and you, yes. you guys have put out, I think it's two records and an EP in that. Yeah, Some maybe a bit more. Maybe really, another. really yeah. beautiful music there. Thank what you. was it like coming back? Is it When I listen to that, yeah. it seems like that's, it sounds to me like music you're doing because you want to do, and you're 
There's yeah. something there's something connective there again, like yeah. you've been talking about tonight. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, at home in Los Angeles and hadn't made music for a while. And, and I'd really decided, you know, uh, we had a son and I was like, hey, I'm not going to be like a lot of musicians I know that just disappear off on tour. And, you know, they don't really bring up their family or stuff. I, I'm going to yeah. do like Patti Smith and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay home. I'm going to be a father to my son, which was very important to me as well because, you know, I hadn't had the greatest relationship with my own father. And um, it was funny. I started thinking about making music and then I, I heard my, my wife sings all the time. You know, she has Filipino and Italian roots. So, you know, she's singing all yeah. the time and laughing. And loves Christmas. And um, so she was singing, you know, all around the thing. And I'd written a few bits of music because I got a home studio and stuff. And I was, I was sitting there pondering. And I was like, I don't need somebody to sing this, you know, because I, I can do some backing vocals, but, you know, the basso profundo is not so great. And uh, I was like, who can I have? And, you know, she's just singing away. And I, okay. Right here. Yeah, right yeah. here, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we don't have to get an extra hotel room on tour, you know, <laughs> she can share with me. So, you know, it's all these things are going around in my head and um, I suggested it to her. Thankfully, she said yes. And uh, we just went from there. And it was such a nice thing to do because, uh, you know, it's music for the sake of making music. And, you know, we did quite a few tours. We did quite a few records. We're going to make more records. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, also I got to ask Michael you know, to come back and play with us and and hang, you know, and we just we just had a nice time. It's like what I'm doing today. It's like a working vacation, you know? Yeah, which right. Which I, I, I like to do that kind of stuff, you know. We, just before the pandemic, we went down to South America and uh, with with my book, and we did like a working vacation there, you yeah. know? And, but that, that was very funny because, you know, one way to get, around to get the funds to get around you know because most publishers don't have you know gallons of money to spread out um i thought well how could i do that so play a few arts festivals and people are you know very nice about that there but then i thought well, okay i could play a few songs with with uh, a band there you know so i felt like i was like chuck berry you know uh, uh, sent but nowadays they send you uh like youtube videos of people Right, like tribute bands. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Right. And, and then I pick out the one that I thought was the best, and and then you'll s sit yeah. in with them essentially. Yeah, I right? sat in yeah. with them. I sat and play play about six songs, and no rehearsal, no sound check. Just come on stage and play. And that is exactly like Chuck Berry. Yeah, in fact. yeah. And, <laughs> and and it's good. And you know what? It always works if you have the good bass player. Yeah, for me, <laughs> this works. You know, the bass player is okay. It's fine. And being as it's you know South America. The interpretation of some of the English versions of the lyrics is is a little different. Okay, but, but you know right. it's okay. They they might have the sound right, but yeah. the words are, something's not there. <laughs> but there again, my Spanish is not that great either. Right, right. But it, that was that was great to do that kind of thing, you know. And um, it's just a way way to enjoy life. And I've started to enjoy music and enjoy the existence of doing yeah. things, you know. And you know. I'm not at liberty to say too many things, but you know there are further things in the in the works coming coming forth out of all awesome. of that. Yeah. Well, we're going to give anybody in the audience a chance to answer, uh, ask questions in a moment. But the last one I wanted to uh, ask you about because you earlier today yeah. were downstairs with right. Greg Harris, our CEO, right. uh, recording an episode. We've talked about him before, Budgie, yeah. of course, yeah. from Susie yeah. and the Banshees. Yeah. You guys have a fantastic podcast that Thank looks you. at Thank you very much. that period of music we've been talking about yeah. called Curious Creatures. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was so funny because uh, obviously I've known Budgie for forty years. You know, since the, the Banshees tour. And I've seen him a few times when he came into town and stuff, but uh, I think about three years ago, he was on tour with John Grant, and a friend of mine was going to do an interview for him. And I said, when you do that interview, you know, let's meet for lunch, because I want to meet Budgie again and talk to him. And uh, so we went downtown in LA somewhere. We met for lunch, and you know that lunch I said, you know what, it's 40 years on, we, we have to do something t together, you know? So it's like, okay, you know? <laughs> and we're like, all right, let's do it. And and originally, there was a third person in there, uh, Kevin Haskins from Bauhaus. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So so my original ideas were like, let's do like, you know, instead of the three tenors, it'll be the three, three drummers. Three drummers, yeah. right. <laughs> right. 
So we did actually rehearse doing some stuff like that for a while, but then we, um, you know, Kevin had to go on tour with the Bear House again. So me and Budgie said, well, what are we going to do meanwhile? Okay, well, podcast. You know, the pandemic was there. We can't do anything else, so yeah, let's do right. the podcast. So, so we started doing the podcast, and we found that we like it a lot, you know, curious creatures that we are. And um, today we did a podcast with, with uh, Greg, and um, it's good so far, I think. But, I mean, that whole thing, I, I always think, you know, we, we, we were there in a period of time that people are very interested in. Yeah. And, and Budgie, I don't know how many of you know him personally, like I do, but he's quite a gre gregarious fellow. And, and I call him our goodwill ambassador, you know, because that everybody likes him, you know. He's only <laughs> right. got to sit there and talk to you, you know, and he's got this cheery, Liverpudlian accent, you know. Uh, everybody likes him immediately. And um, so he puts people at, at ease. But he also knows, like, if there's people from that time in the 80s and in this, the music scene that I don't know, I know Budgie knows them, you know. So between the pair of us, we know everybody. Yeah, in the absolutely. whole thing. So, you know, for the podcast, it was a no-brainer. We can call them up or call somebody we know that knows them if we've lost their number. And, you know, 99 times out of 100, they say yes, first time, which has been very nice for us, you know, very gratifying. And um, it's been very easy. It's like I say, because, you know, all deference, but they're, you know, th people talk to us because they know we're not the journalists. We're not, you know, the newspapers. We're not yeah. things, you know. And... Uh, they very soon forget that, you know, this is going to be broadcast. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's almost like an old conversation among friends. Yeah. They, they, well, I, I, captured I, it, right? I, I liken it a bit to, you know, the good cop, bad cop, you know, because, <laughs> I, you know, I come in and say something contentious and then Budgie will smooth it over and, you know, we get we get the answer we want out of them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. No, it's not that cunning. Trust me. No. <laughs> we just have a conversation and... Um, We've really enjoyed it, and and we're going to move to bigger and better things in that way. Awesome. So you know, and I know it's season two you're doing right now, so we're looking forward season to two more of those. Doing right now, season three will be the one though. Season three, I, I can't say too much, but it's going to be very important. All right, you heard so, it here first. Yeah. All yeah. right. Right. Well, uh, why don't we turn it over and let's see if there's some questions here in the audience. If anybody. Uh, Lisa's going to come around with a microphone just so we capture it here for the recording as well. So raise your hand if anybody has a question for Lowell. It's all, it's all right. I don't bite. No. All right. Hang on, Lisa. We got one right over here. All right. Um, here, we'll just, uh, if you don't mind grabbing the microphone. Oh, he's got a piece of paper and everything, though. So I think he came prepared. <laughs> Pick one to start with. Seriously <laughs> prepared. <laughs> Seriously. Um, first off, uh, your son yes, the other day at the Grog Shop was fantastic. I mean, it, Topographies are such a great band. Um, and also the book, loved it. Um, I think I bought a pair of drumsticks for that one. So, yeah, to contribute to uh, making the book. But I was wondering how um, – I'll go with this one. What do you think is the, the biggest difference between playing with The Cure and producing other bands that you also played with, like Baroque Bordello, The Bonapartes, and, and also The Trees? And what was the difference between what you did with The Cure and how you, you were with those bands? Well, yeah, uh, I suppose uh, – yeah, no, there's a lot of difference because I'm not – personally invested in those those other bands as such you know i mean i like all the people that you've men mentioned you know i really like their music that's why i agreed to work with them but um you know i have to be a different person for that that i have to put the other hat on you know uh it's like i have to believe in the the, the alchemy of what they're doing and try to deliver that for them you know try to I don't know, be the interpreter for their ideas, you know, especially. Um, with The Cure, I'm just, uh, I was just an interpreter for my own ideas and, and the ideas of my closest friends, because that's who they were, you know? And uh, it's a different process. I mean, in some ways, it has more, uh, it, it's harder to be a good producer. It's easy to be a bad producer, I think, but it's harder to be a good producer because you have to, you have to really care about what you're doing and you have to understand what it is. Whereas with our stuff, you know, it was a lot of stuff's left unsaid because there's so much history that you automatically interpret what's what's going on. You know, so I think that's probably the, the easiest I way I can say it. Because I love the keyboard work that you did with. Um 
like the Bonapartes. I thought right. it was great. Thank you. I thought that was great. So that's yeah, the songs no, you did I, on I, that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, what kind of synthesizers were you using? Yeah, you'll have yeah. you'll have to speak quite loud because oh. I'm I'm quite deaf nowadays. Uh, what kind of synthesizers were you using when you were recording? Like, I don't know, like a forest, for example. Well, forest, it was it was like some of the early Roland stuff, like mono synths and things and that. And then we discovered the the ARP Selena, the string machine, you know, and that. We, only has really one good sound. <laughs> right, but yeah. it's really good. But it's really good. Yeah, yeah. and and you can't uh, you can't copy it. I tried one time. I, I had a new emulator. I, I actually I got it before it had even come out from the company in California. I, I had the manual with the the engineer's handwritten notes in it about Is that what right? to do. Yeah, uh -huh. so so it was. I was very pleased to get that, and I tried. You know, to sample the, the, the Selena so that we could take it on with this and then it never quite worked, Just you know. Get there, yeah, right. yeah, so, you know, you have to have... The, it's all to do about, you know, the bad components and, you know, how they make the sound like that. I mean, Trent Reznor liked doing that. I, I read with the um, with Nine Inch Nails, you know, that he would take, you know, synths that were slightly broken or something's gone wrong with them because that gives them character. And I, I kind of understand that. That was... One way I was trying to do it, I didn't have a modular then, but uh, later on I got a modular for that reason because, you know, it doesn't matter what you do on a modular, you can never get the same sound twice. Yeah. And it, it's good. But we, we went through a succession of uh, emulators and things. One of the keyboards I really liked to use live because it was really crap, but it, but it lasted... You know, it was like indestructible. Was the end Sonic Mirage? I mean, you, oh, you had I to played learn it in Sonic VFX. In yeah, fact, very right. similar. Yeah, and you had to learn hexadecimal to program this thing, which you know is insane. But um, you could pour a pint of beer in it, and it would still work. <laughs> so, so you know, my my and the keys feel really good on it. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're like cheap plastic things, but they're fine. You know, my my long suffering. Uh, Technician Bruno, you know, he w I would come to uh, sound check and he'd have the N Sonic upside down with the the hard drive hanging out of it and the hair dryer, you know, trying to dry oh out no. whatever whatever I'd poured down it, you know, <laughs> last night. So yeah, I know they were very roadworthy. Yeah, but, that, uh, which is useful, right? Yeah, I mean, it's important. very useful. You know, I mean, you know, like uh, some of the early Fairlights, you know, people were taking them on tour, like Michael Jackson, but you know. S two degrees difference in temperature, everything go absolutely sideways. You know, I had one set up that actually I got from Peter Gabriel's shop, which I thought would be really, really useful. Like at the time, you know, I was at the front of the stage, which is where I like to be, but you know, all my controls and everything were back about you know 15 foot behind me, and I thought, well, I can't really run backwards and forwards and change settings on. I had like this complicated mixer thing. Yeah, I can't really. How could I do it? Oh, infrared remote. So I got this very expensive infrared remote system, you know, and I could put the little thing on the keyboard and press, you know, one or two buttons and it would change everything, which worked great until we started doing outdoor gigs, you know, with in the middle of the summer, like, you know, Arizona playing in, you know, the, the Devil's Stadium or whatever, and the sun, you know, Stop just the it, yeah, it in, interferes completely, you know, and I'd be like, <laughs> Look, looking at Bruno, like, oh my God, what's happening? He's got, ah, sun. Okay, and he'd run round and you know change the buttons. So, it, it, you know, in the end, it's like uh, the De Chevaux, you know, the Citroen car. You know, it, its gear handle goes directly to the gearbox. You know, there is no fancy electronic stuff in there. You know, usually works best. You know, <laughs> right. Yeah. That was great. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Lowell is going to be just down there signing copies of the book, so please stick around. We're going to have you go out the uh, door here into the hallway and line up so that you can uh, come and get it signed. And yeah. let me say, Lowell Tolhurst, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for letting me prattle on for you know an hour or so. And... Uh, yeah, it's been very nice. Thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great night.